here. She is Madeline Moya. She's been with them since 2012. She has a degree in information studies from UT, and she worked there in the Harry Ransom Center, uh, their archive you may be familiar with. But she's also worked in records management for Travis County, uh, worked in a record store, and long been a film aficionado. So with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Madeline to talk about uh, film preservation, what to do with the films you have at home, and the process that they do in preserving all of our Texas museums, uh, Texas films, for, uh, for everyone to be able to enjoy and learn from. Madeline. Hi, guys. Um, as she said, I'm Madeline Moya. I'm the managing director at the Texas Archive of the Moving Image. I'm going to start our program with one of our most recent and very exciting discoveries at the archive that you, as Fort Worth residents, will hopefully enjoy. You know, you look at a city this time of morning from a distance and it's like you're looking at it for the first time, and maybe you are. And you wonder what it's like, who lives here, how'd they get here, why, why'd they come? And what caused a city to grow up on this particular piece of ground anyhow? What made it take root and grow when lots of the others just sort of died out? Now. It happens I know some of the answers about this city, not because I live here, because I don't, but because I got lucky some years back and discovered this place, and I came to think a lot of it. I made many good friends here. I still come back often, and sometimes, well, sometimes it's just hard to pull away. There's a feeling of warmth that you don't normally feel in other parts of the country. When I'm walking down the street with friends of mine from other places, and I say hello, and somebody says hello back, and they'll say, who was that? I say, I don't know. I say, but you just spoke to him, and he spoke to you. I say, That's Fort Worth. I guess every town has a flavor or a personality all its own, but this one seems to have more than most. At least of the ones I've been to. It's got lots of things that you'd expect it to have, and other things that you never dreamed it had. The old and the new together in an unexpected blend. That's Fort Worth, Texas. The unexpected city. Anyone recognize that narrator? <laughs> we in the office were just listening with glee as we realized that one of our favorite classic Hollywood actors was talking about one of our favorite Texas cities. Um, and in addition to Jimmy Stewart providing the narration, this film al also captures some prominent Fort Worth residents talking about their city in the 1970s. There's Bob Ray Sanders, Steve Moran, Alan Sampson, Pete Perez, and Charles Tandy just shortly before he passed away. Um, this particular film is one th that we just collected from the Fort Worth Library last month in anticipation of this roundup event that we're having this weekend. And it's a hidden gem that was laying in a collection that now gets to have a whole new life after digitization, which is what I'm here to talk to you guys about today. So as I mentioned, we, I work for the Texas Archive of the Moving Image, or as we like to call it, TAMI. TAMI was founded in 2002 by film archivist and University, at Austin University of Texas at Austin professor Dr. Caroline Frick. And we're a nonprofit that works to discover, preserve, provide access to, and educate the community about Texas's film heritage. TAMI's collection includes home movies, B-roll, amateur films, advertisements, local television, educational films, and industrial productions, just to name a few. While we do have some Hollywood productions in our collection, we kind of represent the other side of film preservation, the non-cinema side of the field. Hollywood films typically have a home and are well taken care of because they can make money. 
our films and videos are typically destined for the dumpster or have been sitting in an attic or garage for several decades. So it, this isn't exactly glamorous film work, but it's more like roll up your sleeves and dive into piles of dirty, smelly films kind of work. Films and videotapes are not made to last. Over 50% of Hollywood produced materials made before 1950 are now considered lost. And for Texas produced materials, the statistics are estimated at closer to 90%. Um, films and videotape are susceptible to heat and humidity, which as you guys probably know full well are two staples of our climate here in Texas. Um, other Texas collections have been lost to hurricanes, floods, or simple neglect. Major Hollywood studios and other large film archives have now built specially designed, humidity controlled, cold storage vaults to help prevent decomposition of films. But most of the films we worked with, work with have not been preserved and stored in this manner. So we get some stuff that's in pretty bad shape, as you can see here. Um, when film decays, it becomes brittle and it shrinks and curls. That's kind of what you see here. These are exceptionally bad examples, but <laughs> even if you just look at a normal film reel that's in, in kind of bad shape, they shrink up and you can start to see it pretty soon. The most common symptom of film deterioration is vinegar syndrome, which is the degradation of the film base. And you can smell vinegar syndrome when you open old film cans that have not been properly stored. Vinegar syndrome can spread, so one decomposing film can spoil an entire collection. So not to be dramatic, but we're kind of in a race against time. Our main project is a partnership with the Texas Film Commission named the Texas Film Roundup, which is again what we're doing here in Fort Worth this weekend. So we travel across the state and collect films and videos targeting regions to represent the entire state of Texas. We usually have some sort of screening program and then we set up in the lobby of a historic theater or the public library and we stay there for a few days to collect films and videotapes. This weekend, um, I'm sure you guys all saw it, we're right out here in the gallery. We accept 16 millimeter, eight, mi eight millimeter and super eight film as well as VHS, Betamax, Umatic and several other videotape formats. The deal is that we take the original materials and we digitize them for free. We return the original along with the digital copy and in exchange, we get to keep a digital copy for our archive. We use it on our website and in educational programming and special events. Texas related is how we define which materials qualify for the film roundup. We loosely define that as made in Texas by Texans or about Texas. So say a family brings in home movies of their family vacations that are outside of Texas, that would still qualify for our program. The thinking being that Texas uh, family vacations were part of Texas home life and Texas culture, therefore, therefore it's part of the Texas experience. We do try to keep our website more narrowly focused on Texas, but we consider part of the mission of the Roundup to be public service and providing new access to these materials to Texas families. To date, we have digitized more than 30,000 items at TAMI. And this is some of our equipment here. This is called a telecine. Um, the film goes through the projector and a digital camera captures several images of each frame of the film. Um, so with 30,000 items, we have a pretty robust collection to work with. But we really have to go through a process of discovery once the films are digitized. Many times we receive films and videos where there is little to no information about them. Um, Someone will come in, they have found their grandparents' films or videos in an attic, and they have no idea what's on them, and they just hand them to us, uh, which is part of the fun, but it leaves our cataloging team with a pretty challenging job sometimes, trying to identify people and places and events that are on screen. Um, that said, it's pretty fascinating work, and I think we end up finding some pretty important pieces of history. What we typically receive from program participants at the Roundup are home movies. An overwhelming majority of these home movies are of backyard birthday parties, Christmas mornings, and Easter Sundays. I love home movies. I think they're beautiful, and I almost never grow tired of watching them. But whether one feels that way or not, what we're trying to do with our program and what we want to teach the public are that home movies and other non-cinematic moving image materials matter. 
they are a crucial part of our public record. Home movies in particular are one of the best documents of our culture that exist. Most of our records as a people are made by the government. That's why archives were established in the first place, to house our government records. But home movies capture emotions, mannerisms, regional accents, and customs, all from the citizen's perspective. They document how families celebrated birthdays and what they wore to church on those Easter Sundays. They document local parades and festivals. So whether you find the content mundane or not, we like to argue that home movies serve a very important purpose. And sometimes, in the middle of Christmases and Thanksgivings, you find a home movie like this one. Let's see if I can make the mouse work. This is a relatively recent discovery of ours that came in during a roundup in Amarillo late last year. The participant's father owned a plow company and traveled to sell the plows. And he believes that his father was traveling in Selma, Alabama on business in 1965, coincidentally, and just found himself here at the time of the march. We have determined that this is the third Selma to Montgomery march, and it's obviously really great footage. This is very timely and relevant to both the film industry with the movie having just come out and to current events. So this was a really great find for us. It's also a classic case of the donor not knowing what was on the film. His father passed away in 1968 when he was 16, and he hadn't touched those films in the closet until he pulled them out to bring them to us. And he did notice that one of the reels was labeled Selma, but he had no recollection of his father being at the march. Um, so this is a great illustration also of why home movies are great historical documents. This footage offers a first-hand look at the ground operations of the movement providing a glimpse of what it was like to be there on the street without bias or dramatization. And obviously not every home movie is gonna be quite so glamorous, but most of them have at least one special moment, or more if you're like me and think most of them are special. But they usually look more like this one. Doing the twist in the living room. Who doesn't love it, you know? <laughs> so at eight millimeter and 16 millimeter film, the videos were pretty consistently posed and film was usually only being rolled if it was a special occasion or the family was all together. This is primarily because film was pretty expensive and a reel only held three to four minutes. So when VHS came around, everything changed, and the contrast with film is pretty stark. Suddenly, families had four hours of videotape for $2, uh, and home movies began being made by the dozen. It's important to note that VHS did democratize the home movie to some extent. Most of our minority family collections are on VHS, which is obviously important when you're trying to represent Texas. Um, and there are some gems on VHS. Uh, all of the best quinceanera footage is on VHS, and many of those videos include the best Aquanet bangs you've ever seen, <laughs> as illustrated here. And we discovered many Mexican folklorico dances performed in El Paso in one family's collection, which you can see at the top there. So that's a really great representation of a local culture in a border town. But for the most part, there's just a lot of filler on tape. Uh, there are just hours long home movies of entire school plays, junior high band concerts, little league games, and then every single gift opened on Christmas morning every single year. And just lots of dead air. A camera gets put on a tripod in the corner and sometimes you get a two hour tape of a punch bowl. Um, it would just kind of get left running. But there are entire decades and cultures documented on VHS, so it's our job to go through those hours of punch bowls and pull out the folklorico dances or the early 1990s fair parades in small towns in Texas. So in addition to home movies found through roundups, we also regularly reach out to local historical societies, libraries, museums, universities, and news stations to find out if they have any film in their collections that we could digitize which greatly serves both organizations. It's a great opportunity for them to get, a new, get new access to their media that's on obsolete formats, 
Um, and you know, obviously it's good for us too. <laughs> um, we've had partner organizations use their digitized materials in exhibits and on display in their lobbies and meeting spaces, on their websites, at community events. And some libraries have made access copies of the materials on DVD that students can actually come and check out and use for research. So they end up getting a lot more use this way. And through these partnerships, we found a lot of great local educational films, tourism tapes from cities or various regions, public access television, films of local industries, and local television news. I'm gonna show you a couple clips from a fan favorite. During a roundup in San Angelo, we were able to acquire the Miss Wool of America collection from Angelo State University. I had never heard of the Miss Wool pageant, but I was naturally very intrigued. It turns out that the National Wool Growers Association, the American Sheep Producers Council, and the Wool Bureau sponsored this pageant from 1952 to 1972. And it was held in San Angelo to celebrate its strong sheep and wool industry. These young women were all Miss Wools in their home states and they would come to San Angelo to compete in the national pageant where they would model all of the latest woolen fashions. Wearing wool in West Texas is absurd, <laughs> but that's part of what makes these films just golden. Um, and this is also, you know, again, a good example of a local history and a local culture that is scarcely represented elsewhere. And we were thrilled as we watched them. I'm going to show you a newsreel from an early pageant and then a brief segment from the Miss Wool pageant in its heyday when it was nationally telecast in a variety show format and celebrities took part in the program. The heartland of America's wool country glows with beauty as 20 young ladies gather in San Angelo, Texas to vie for the title of Miss Wool of America. The lambs are cute, but not too bright. Who in his right mind would run away from these shepherdesses? A more appreciative crowd gathers for the final choosing. The lambs are safely corralled and cuddled. The contestants come from all parts of the country for the contest. The judges weigh their decision carefully, and when it comes, it sets the crowd off, for the winner is a home state girl, Carolyn Barry, a Texas Women's University student from Yoakum. In addition to her title and crown, Carolyn gets a new wardrobe, several scholarships, and a lot of traveling to show off the beauties of American wool. So this was from the 1968 pageant, and you'll see Art Linklater here, but this year, the same year, Frankie Avalon and June Allison were also participants in the variety show pageant. Miss Wool of Colorado, Mary Smiley. Mary Smiley, as you might guess, is a skier, and it's a wonder we haven't run into each other at Aspen or Snowmass. I wish we would have. We will next Christmas. I promise. It's a bet. <laughs> now, you like sports. Do you like fellas? Oh, very much. What awesome. do you think of hippies? Well, I like them too, but I like boys better. Well, I mean... Thank you very much. <laughs> These are really great fun. <laughs> in 2011, we partnered with the Brazoria County Historical Museum, and they had two collections. They had their own at the museum that was comprised mainly of materials uh, from the county, from government activities. And they also had the Jim W. Keeland collection. Jim W. Keeland was a photographer and videographer in the Houston area for 60 years. He took photographs and films for Houston's NBC affiliate, KPRC and he worked for the Houston Post for 20 years and was a freelance photographer of agricultural subjects. So this particular footage is of an FFA rodeo in Alvin in 1956, and his other films include footage of cattle drives, stockyards, and cotton gins, which are great examples of Texas's cowboy culture and the farm and ranch industry in Texas. I just think these are really beautiful images.
And from the Brazoria County Historical Museum's own collection is this local access television PSA. It's over an hour long, so we shortened it down dramatically for you. Um, it was produced in Angleton in 1983 for the First Baptist Church's public access channel, and it features the civil defense director for Brazoria County, the sheriff, and a meteorologist from Alvin. And we consider this significant for several reasons. It speaks to the church's role in the community, which was so prominent that they had their own television station. Uh, it illustrates how television was used as a vehicle to communicate to a community, and it captures scenes of county officials and their activities, and most importantly, in my mind, are the regional accents. As you guys know, these regional accents are dying out, so preserving these examples of local dialects uh, that are soon to be extinct, I think, is very important. The Brazoria County Civil Defense presents the Hurricane Preparedness Plan. And now here's our Civil Defense Director, Mr. Jack McCann. I am Jack McCann, your Missouri County Emergency Manager or Civil Defense Coordinator for Missouri County. We're fixing to have a little hurricane preparedness program here with uh, Steve Hornard, our weatherman from Alvin, and Sheriff Joe King, who will tell us about the uh, evacuation plans for the county. The Texas Gulf Coast is one of the most hazardous prone coastal regions in the United States. That's about all we need of that. <laughs> one of our earliest partner organizations was the historic Brownsville Museum, who had some really beautiful 16 millimeter footage of the Charo Days Fiesta. Charo's Day, Charo Days Fiesta is held every year in Brownsville to celebrate the traditions, culture, and shared heritage of the Texas-Mexico border region. It dates back to 1938, but it continues to be an important part of Brownsville culture every year. The fiesta is held in late February and includes parades, traditional dance and dress, which is what you'll see in this clip I'm gonna show you, arts and crafts, music and food, as well as special performances and events. So this not only documents border culture, but it also captures a Texas town's biggest local festival and celebration of its history and heritage. So many Texas towns have these small festivals like this, and each one is so unique. There's Mission Citrus Fiesta, Cuero's Turkey Fest, Clute has a Mosquito Festival. Uh, I grew up outside of Houston in a town called Rosenberg, and we had the Czech Fest and it was such a big event every year, and it was a huge part of my upbringing. So I feel like these small local festivals are really important to document. I've never been to Charo Days, but I hope that they still wear such elaborate outfits. That one's my favorite. And this last film is from the East Texas Research Center, and it has a really unique story. Um, it captures scenes of, the, of residents, school children, and local businesses in Nacogdoches, Texas in 1938. This film was likely made by an itinerant filmmaker. Itinerant filmmakers were professional filmmakers who visited towns across America and would spend a few days there filming. Uh, they would primarily focus on the residents and film for four or five days, and then at the end of the week they would show the film at the local theater to the residents and they got to see themselves on screen. Um, this particular film was discovered by a Nacogdoches High School assistant principal named Erwin DeBose when he was uh, during a renovation of the high school in the 1960s. So the film was found in the school attic and it was outside of its can, it was just a loose reel and all it said was Nacogdoches 1938. And he picked it up, thought maybe this is important and put it on his desk but then never really touched it again. But he did keep it throughout the years. And in 2014, his son gave it to the East Texas Research Center who had it digitized. 
So Mr. DuBose and the town of Nacogdoches finally got to see this rare piece of Nacogdoches history after it was digitized. They got a glimpse of their town more than 75 years ago. And this ended up being a really beneficial partnership because the East Texas Research Center got a high quality transfer of this film, as well as new access to the campaign ads of Charlie Wilson, whose collection they had. So we got to work with all of those materials and they were on a ton of different tape formats, so it was a really fun project for us as well. Uh, but here's a glimpse at Nacogdoches in Here's a tiny man on a tiny horse. And he is tough. As we go through all these films, we add a selection to our website for free public access. And right now we have a f about 3,000 videos online. So what we're actively trying to do now is get people interested in the content and to use all of this stuff that we've worked so hard to collect and preserve. So we write several content features each month. I'm gonna go to our website here. Uh, we'll write in new releases that features some of the films that we have just put up online the previous month that are new to our collection, or at least new to the website. Um, we'll write a mystery video whenever we're trying to identify some stuff on film that we just can't place. Um, or sometimes we have our student interns write pieces about discoveries they've made while working with us at TAMI. We also create several lesson plans each year that educators can use for free in the K-12 through social studies classroom. We dedicate an entire portion of our website to these lesson plans. It's the education part. Um, and we have an education specialist on staff who is a former teacher and has an MA in public history. She writes these lesson plans and tries to find new creative ways to incorporate the films into classroom activities. My favorite one right now is this history in your own backyard activity. And I you guys can look at this yourselves, but all of them, all of these um, lesson plans and activities use our films as primary sources and they're all TEKS compliant. So they're really good for teachers to use. Our most recent endeavor have been these web exhibits that we have been producing. They kind of walk, we pick a theme and then we walk viewers through the subject and show them different videos that illuminate the topic. We started with films shot on location in Texas and put together an exhibit called Starring the Lone Star State, which became the model for how we want to use our films going forward, moving away from being just a search and retrieve repository and more into a content presenta presentation website where we show people the films and tell them why they're very cool. Our most popular one has been this When Texas Saw Red. This highlights some of our Cold War films in our collection and explores the way that Cold War culture permeated Texas news, politics, home life, schools, careers, and entertainment. And for the first time with this exhibit, we created a corresponding lesson plan that uses the films from the exhibit as the primary source materials for the lesson. We also recent re recently released an exhibit about amateur s cinema that features many videos from our roundups. It's full of unique m materials that are more creative narrative works that were made by people at home. And then we have one coming up that's gonna be about the Apollo missions and the space program in Texas. So these have all been pretty fun. So now that I've walked you guys through some of our films and our website, I thought I'd go over some basic rules for preservation in your own home on both film and videotape. This is kind of a list of do's and don'ts and we have these on paper out in the gallery if you'd like to pick them up. But you wanna make sure that you store 
any of your personal audiovisual materials in a cold, dark, and dry space, like a closet or under a bed. You want to keep the materials in their containers, and you want to lay film reels flat and keep videotapes up on their edge, upright. You want to try not to handle your materials if you don't have to, and always return them to their cases after viewing. If you start to notice any signs of decomposition, you want to get in touch with a professional as soon as possible. You can notice a lot of the damage yourself just by looking at the object and smelling it, which sounds weird, but you have to. You can always see mold or mildew, and when films start to decompose, as I mentioned before, you can smell that vinegar smell. And if any of the, your materials start to decay, you want to separate them from the other materials as the decomposition can spread. We always recommend digitizing your materials, of course, but we also recommend keeping the originals after digitization <coughs> as new technology always develops and you can always get a better transfer from the original materials than from something that is already a transfer, a second generation copy. You always wanna keep that original. And here's a handy little guide that we've made that you can find on our website about where it's best to store home movie materials in your home. Though none of us have cold vaults at our home, you can still find some places around the house that are pretty safe for your films and videos. You obviously don't want to put them in the attic. See, the red means no, not in the attic. Uh, that's where there's no AC during the summer months, which I, as we've talked about, the heat can get to those materials. Um, also nowhere near moisture, like under the bathroom or kitchen sink, which is actually somewhere people put their films and videos. Um, they should not be exposed to sunlight, so inside a closet or under a bed is best. And you don't want to keep them in a hot place like a garage or near a dryer. And I think this is a basement down here on the right. But you don't want, again, to put them anywhere where they could uh, be susceptible to flooding. So that's about it. I was just going to open it up to questions if anyone had any. Um, and I encourage you guys to take a look at our exhibit out in the gallery. You can watch some more films that we have playing out there, and you can get a close-up uh, look and smell at some decomposing films, so you can know what that looks like. And thanks for coming. Um, and I stepped out for just a second. Did you mention about the, the vinegar smell and the nitrite films and the hazards that can be involved? Yes. Well, I didn't talk about nitrate film partic uh, specifically, mostly because no one, no home movies are ever going to be on nitrate film. Those are all 35 millimeter Hollywood productions, and it's really early and really rare. But it is fun to talk about because they can spon spontaneously combust. Um, if you guys have ever seen that Tarantino movie uh, where the she lights the cinema on fire and it bursts into flames, that's because it was all nitrate film. It's what all the early Hollywood productions were made on. Um, so they are very flammable and very dangerous, and they have to be kept in freezers or cold vaults. Um, but that's not around very much anymore, and none of you guys should, I hope, have nitrate in your homes. That early film that you showed about Cold War, is it available on your website or somewhere else? It will be soon. As I said, we just got it. Uh, it's part of the Fort Worth Libraries collection, so we just picked it up last month. and. We've been working on transferring the films in their collection. We actually just retransferred that one in HD, so we will have it in our, on our website in the next few weeks. And it should be a really nice copy. It's very pretty. Yeah, you guys should pick up some of our printed materials out in the gallery that has all of our information on it. This is an ongoing program. We won't only work with films and videos while we're here in Fort Worth. It, it goes on year, year round. So if you pick up some of, that, of the materials out there, there's a, a general email address on there, and you're welcome to email us and tell us about what you have, and we can figure out a way to work with you. Yes, sir? About the, the beauty pageant, I have to ask, was there a wool swimsuit competition? <laughs> <laughs> there, there are many scenes of these girls in swimsuits, but uh, I don't think any of them were woolen. But there are some really creative outfits. There are like hooded head-to-toe wool jumpsuits of a certain print that have a matching coat and when the coat opens it has the same print as the jumpsuit inside. It's very intricate. But I, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? They might shrink too much but those films are all really entertaining and they're all on our website so you can find them all there. 
it seemed like every year for a while there when they were nationally telecasting the, the program, they got some pretty high profile celebrities to take part every year, which baffles me still, but I'm so glad it happened because now we get to have those films. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Thank you very much, mm -hmm. everyone, and thank you to all the staff of Tammy for being here with us this weekend.